Good. I hope you get as much as you can out of this class. Pediatrics. Uh, pediatrics. <laughs> Great. Uh, let's start with pediatrics, okay? Um, you're dealing with children, and you know it's a, it's a different uh, ball game than dealing with adults. And so all those courses that you've taken in undergrad, such as psychology, child psych, adolescent psych, I mean, all those courses are going to help your foundation in understanding children. So it is a great profession, and we wish you well with that. Those of you who want to go on to orthodontics, terrific profession. This is the time to decide, I feel. I mean, there might be some other things that comes along the way in dental school that you may admire even better, but if you have your mindset early, it's a very competitive field, as, as uh, Jim was talking about. You know, it's any specialty, you have to be at the top of your class. And uh, so think about it early because it'll set the stage, you know, and, and every step of the way. I can tell you that I've treated um, not many kids in my practice. Um, I do enjoy treating kids, but uh, not every one of them fits into my practice. I work well with another pediatric dentist in town, and you know I can give you his name later on and his phone number. You can go and shadow in his office. The same as in orthodontics. I have several orthodontists in town, and it's a great idea to go there and find out everything you can about orthodontics. Do it now. Uh, now's the time. When you're in dental school, it's not going to be any time to be running around except getting what you need to get through the dental school. So we were talking before Logan brought up, you know, what do you need to, for the specialty? You need academics and you need clinical. You've got to have both up really high. And, and, you know, it's the way it is. Um, how many classes, how many people in a class? You might have six, you might have four, you might have 12, depending upon the specialty and the school. Not all schools are going to be the same. Um, there might be a, a less competitive school out in uh, Nebraska somewhere. Alaska, wherever, you know, versus maybe New York or Las Vegas or, or California. You know. uh, so keep that in mind about specialties. I'm going to try to cover today as best I can and just giving you one specialty in the field of orthodontics, so it hopefully it covers, you know, pediatrics as well. When you talk about pediatrics, you talk about dentition and, and jaws that are smaller, and there's mixed dentition. So uh, teeth, develop over time, the, uh, the jaws develop over time, and the person develops over time. So uh, all of that's such a, a specialty. In pediatrics, um, you'll do a lot of dentistry. Um, you'll also not only do fillings, uh, you may do some orthodontics as a pediatric dentist to maintain a space. You may also do some exodontia or oral surgery, uh, which is, is a good thing. Uh, you know, anytime you can you can help a child develop their their jaws and their dentition, and, and also make them very comfortable as a patient. Um, I hear a lot of horror stories when I get an adult that comes in and says, "I've always been afraid of the dentist," and it's always happened as a child. Something happened early that set their mind, and now that makes them the nervous, most nervous, most. Uh, the dentist the most undesirable person in their life. Now they got to go to the dentist. They usually become less and less of a good patient and then develop more and more problems. So you have the chance to make the difference in somebody's life. Um, and you, you develop that, you learn all these disciplines. And uh, I'll tell you, one of my, two of my favorite teachers in dental school were, one was a pediatric dentist, and uh, I forget, Dr. Cannon, he did a great job with us, and then we had an orthodontist that also helped us do a full orthodontic case. So in undergrad, I had a chance to do both. Today, it's going to be about a removable retainer. Um, so without any further ado, I'm going to go cover some of that. You might want to come in a little closer to see some of these things that, that an orthodontist would set up in his office. And you know, uh, we talk about the jaws and the development, you know, the jaw itself. The jaw has not only teeth, but it has a thing called the alveolar process. In order to move a tooth through the process, you have to either tip it through or bodily move it. We, most of us like to see a tooth that's moved in such a way that it, be, it remains uh, parallel, what we call bodily moving the tooth, not necessarily tipping it. Uh, why is that important? Anybody? Well, we move teeth bodily because you know, we want it to align perfectly with the tooth next to it. Sometimes if we tip teeth, they may look good, but the, the, the idea that the root is not in the right position and 
how stable is that going to be under force? So we want to get the, the tooth under the right position, but not only that, but the root itself, so bodily movement. Um, there's a couple of ways to do it. There's um, Everybody talks about Invisalign. Um, Invisalign is basically a computer-generated image <coughs> from a model of which you take an impression for your model. It goes to a lab. The lab makes um, a digital image, and then the computer does the rest. And what you receive back is basically a box of consecutive uh, digital uh, produced retainers and a little form for the dentist or the orthodontist to uh, to to, uh, to follow. So, anybody here have uh, Invisalign? You did. So, what? Uh, how long did it take you to go through Invisalign? About a year. About a year. And. Uh, Remember how many trays you had? Uh, it was uh, one count. every two weeks. One every two weeks. Okay. So probably has to be about forty trays. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. Times that to buy two, so you get about eighty. Um, I always uh, we have another person. You're, you're in you're in orthodontics now, but you're not in Invisalign. So you're with braces and brackets and brackets. Um, Unlike Invisalign, brackets are bonded to each tooth. Uh, they're made of either metal or they're sapphire. You can see through them. Um, they're positioned and then repositioned periodically to, to give you a certain effect of uh, one tooth or several teeth. There's also an arch wire that goes along with your case versus Invisalign, in which is it's clear plastic. So this seems to be more popular today, but it can't service every case. Um, I gotta ask both, since you're here with me, uh, your bands are on. Do you feel much tenderness and pain? Yeah, you know, so you feel some sensitivity. How long does it last? Uh, how long do you have to have it? Uh, does the sensitivity last? Well, every day we see tightening up my wires, like two days, three days. Yeah, okay. yeah. But then it lasts <laughs> for, how long does it last? For? It's only like three days, four days, I get used to it. All right, so with, the, with your experience and basically your teeth that are moving, mm -hmm. body moving, mm -hmm. and it's putting pressure on the bone, mm -hmm. and so you're getting the bone to go away in front of the tooth, and you're getting bone to deposit behind it, so you get opposition and deposition. Now, we talked about um, how fast can you move teeth in the mouth, and someone's uh, answered that, so I, I, my answer was, well, you, you want to move them, but you don't want to move them too quickly. It's a slow, steady process. You've got to be patient because it's treating um, a person the rest, for the rest of their lives. And so that's part of the, the, the transition, part of the treatment. If you move a tooth too fast, you can develop something called root blunting. And root blunting means you could lose the end of your tooth or the end of your root permanently. So what causes root blunting? Possibly uh, a little bit of, of moving the tooth too quickly, or possibly there might be a functional habit. You might uh, have biting on a pen cap, and the way your teeth come together, you might be putting a little excessive force, or it could be a genetic thing. You might have uh, an issue with uh, just you know genes. You know you you might have had a sister that had the same problem and then all of a sudden you have it, or a brother that didn't have the problem but you have it. We don't know when that gene, I don't think we have enough evidence that, to talk about what exactly causes root blunting. Um, so what I recommend is taking one x-ray of the um, upper two front and central incisors and then two of the lower every six months so that you can troubleshoot and check that and check it with an original x-ray to two right together and make sure there's no blunting. If blunting occurs, then just remove your, your, your braces, uh, the arch wire. You don't have to take all the brackets off. <laughs> just let things settle a little bit and then come back to it again and, and see if it goes away. Uh, so there's a lot of studies on that. I don't want to get too involved in that. Just to cover some of the things in orthodontics. So uh, great method. Um, and. Uh, You'll learn more about that in dental school. Uh, questions and all? So today it's going to be about wire bending. Let me back up a little bit. In dental school, um, we've taken alginates. Uh, 
but we haven't poured the bases to the alternates. And this is a little bit about the base requirements. Uh, most dental schools want to see you um, have the same dimension as the base as the arch itself. So if you measure the base and measure the, the amount of arch space, it needs to be about one to one. With that. Uh, number two, um, when you trim your models in dental school, you want to trim them so that they're even in just about every dimension possible. This, this student did pretty well, would you say, on their model trimming. You can balance the models. Well, almost. But anyway, that's, that's one of the requirements, um, and you'll learn that in technique lab, um, how to properly trim uh, a base for, uh, for a pediatric or orthodontic case. So these are good disciplines. Um, today, we're going to go back to our stations, and I'm going to give you a demo on how to make what we call a Holly retainer. After you go through braces and tooth movement, you want a, a retainer made, a retention. Now, Maya, you got, uh, you're wearing something called a retainer, but it's a clear retainer like this. Yeah, it looks just like that, a so, little harder. A little harder. And there might be a term called Essex retainer or, or some type of retainer that, that, uh, that looks like uh, uh, a clear matrix. You know, there's no metal involved in this, and it snaps into place, and you wear that to, uh, usually in the evening, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but sometimes, uh, sometimes we wear it during the day. Uh, or if you're right after your case, you probably would wear it 24 hours until you, until you settle. Uh, today, um, we're going to incorporate metal, and we're going to use it, um, an upper mold or an upper model so that we can uh, utilize something called the, the pallet or the roof of your mouth. And so, after we wire bend, we're going to apply the acrylic and we're going to try to come up with um, a final retainer that looks like this, um, where you have a wire that's bent uh, from one end of the model to the other. So we'll select which teeth we're going to start with and then we'll bend a loop and then have it touch all the teeth, make full contact because you don't want any teeth moving around. Right? So you've got to make sure that the labial surfaces all touch. And there's a loop in here for a reason. Um, if and when a tooth starts to move or gets out of place, um, we have a place to go to tighten the retainer, and the loop is the place. Um, so it makes it easy. The pallet is another issue. The pallet, you want that acrylic to be an even thickness throughout. You don't want it real thick in the middle because then the tongue doesn't have a place to go. Okay, so you don't want to give the patient a lisp. So, um, so, and I'll show you how to do that the right way. Um, and you want it to be.